All right, we are live for another live Q and A, and this time we're with uh, Mike Napier, who's a former uh, Hawk uh, T1 instructor and Tornado GR1 pilot. But yeah, Mike, what's been happening? It's been a while since uh, we've chatted and had you on the channel. Yeah, it is. I, th I think last time it was Happy Hour, wasn't it? We uh, I think so it we was. Yes. Live Q and A, and this time we're with um... Yep. Yeah, so yeah, you just continue. So yeah, it was happy hours. So uh, I mean, uh, there's been a lot going on your end. You, you, uh, you're pushing out these books. <laughs> like uh, every time I see you on <laughs> on Twitter, they're, they're out there. So yeah, what's been happening on the author end, uh, the writing process? Yeah, that, that, that's what's uh, been, been keeping me busy, actually. Um, I've, I, I was doing some uh, flying with the Air Experience flight at Benson, but that's come to an end now. Um, but yeah, the, the books have been uh, have, have been coming thick uh, and fast. So yeah, it's great that I've been asked to, to do them, actually. But yeah, I've, I've done, well, 15 of them have been published thus far. Uh, there's two more in the tubes now to go. And I've just started, actually, on... Uh, on number what's that num number 18 to uh, I've, I've literally just started so uh, yeah it's keep, keeping me busy and uh, I, I enjoy it it's good fun yeah so guys get your questions coming in the side there for Mike but I want to know a bit like a bit more about the writing process how I mean do, does an author uh, like a publisher say like you need this this and this or you can you can say right this is what I want to do if you want to publish it or not I'll go elsewhere it, it actually it varies quite a lot and it, it started with me writing stuff and saying could somebody publish it to which the answer generally was no but then um we then i, I ended up working with an editor who um who's who had contacts with various um publishers and he, he came up with ideas and say oh what about this and then would would then pump that to the you know i i then wrote a sort of a proposal which uh, which he then sent off to to um the um the publishers and they then said yep we'll do that um but actually some of the more recent ones of the publishers have, have got back to me and said oh can you do one on xyz so uh, yeah so it's, it's, it's a bit of everything really and i sort of come up with the occasional ideas myself and think i'd like to do that which don't they don't always get there <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's a mixture really so it's a real sort of mixture of uh, you know what ideas from a third party ideas from the publisher and, uh, and my own occasionally my own ideas so uh, yeah there you go. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. And all the links for Mike's books are in the description below. And you can also follow yeah. him on Twitter. Uh, so go and pick one of them up. I've got a, a couple of myself and you've signed a few, which are little, uh, you know, treasures of mine on my bookshelf. But Mike, as you can see, there's some questions coming in on the side. I see so I'm, I'm going to let yeah. you loose. But uh, yeah, guys, get your questions coming for Mike. I'm sure he's happy to uh, answer them. So Mike, off you go. Okay, yeah. So, uh, so I see the first couple of questions there from Hack and Engman, and uh, the first one is, how well is a typhoon able to replace the tornado in the air to ground roll? And I have to say, I don't really know because I, I don't know much about the capability of the typhoon. But yeah, as far as I know, it does it very well indeed. Um, it, uh, I think the initial typhoons were just air to air, but um, the later versions have got all the air to ground stuff in them. Um, it can carry all the um, all the ordnance that tornado could and probably more as well and it appears to be very very good at it so so i think the answer to the question is it does it very well um you've then asked why is tornado still flying in germany and not in britain um i think i'm right in saying but i could be wrong that the um the german ones are the ecr the electronic combat and recce versions um and i think that's something that the typhoon doesn't do but also i think that i'm right in saying that the germans probably don't have the same um financial pressure from their on their defense budget so um where we got rid of things fairly quickly i think they're, they're able to keep on with them and i guess in the specific roles it's worth their while keeping the airplane going and again what i don't know is how how many typhoons they've got in comparison to how many tornadoes they had before um but yeah it, it, it does a good job for them so uh, so i guess they, they, they keep it going um there's uh, oops, I just jumped over there. All the questions have so um, Max's mediocre model says, was it the right decision to retire Tornado, or could it have been better, or would it have been better to uh, have an upgraded variant, e.g. GR5, with glass cockpit, more advanced weapon systems, etc. Um, interesting question. Um, my my own feeling is that it, Tornado had had its day really. Um, 
it was undoubtedly a fantastic machine in the um, you know it, when it was designed in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and really pro probably right up till, till, till when it left. But um, fundamentally, it was designed uh, as a low-level bomber. And the, the engines were optimised for, for low level. The wings were optimised for low level. And really, it, it, in the sort of more recent years, the aeroplane's been used at medium level, where neither the engines nor the uh, nor the wings are particularly efficient or particularly happy. So I think really the aeroplane will probably come to to, to its limits really and particularly in terms of maneuverability and things like that which have become much more important i mean if, if you're at low level and you're going a straight line very fast then that's great so things like uh, f111 things like tornado um, worked well in that environment um, once you take them upstairs um you know you really do need to be able to to, to be much more maneuverable and uh, you know and have particularly the engine power you know to get you up and down quickly so um yeah I, I, much as it would have been lovely to think of a, a gr5 i don't think it was a practical um concern really i mean the other th all thing also is that tornado was very uh, labor intensive um and spares intensive in terms of keeping it going so um, all those kind of myths uh, militated and uh, towards you know a, a newer airplane that was that was more reliable um we're back to Hacko Engman again has asked another couple of questions. Why is swing wing technology out of the door now? And, or is it, he says. And the answer is, I think, it, yes, it is. Um, again, that was a very 1960s solution to the problem of how do you have an aeroplane that, um, you know, that, that, w that has docile characteristics at slow speeds, but also then has um, you know, reasonably good characteristics at high speed. Um, and, and the answer really is that... Um, that that was the 1960s technology that since then um, aerodynamics have, um, have have come on hugely um, and also things like digital technology control technology so you you can build a, a wing shape which would have been unthinkable perhaps in the 1960s because you didn't have the um, ability to, to to control the airplane but now you do i mean things like f16 which is um yeah unstable really without all the um uh, fly wire keeping it up um and so th it's really um been overtaken by technology i would say and yeah I, th I think it is a thing of the past i mean the other thing of course is that if you've got a, a swing wing airplane it has to have hydraulic systems and everything else moving bits so the complexity and the weight go up hugely so if you can have an airplane that doesn't have those then then obviously that there's a you know, great saving there in terms of, of weight and, and complexity so so i think that's uh, that that's why it's out of the way and that's why it's probably not ever going to come back i would think um has today's technology forever removed the need for a backseater good question uh, my own view as a kind of died in the wall two seat man is uh, is no i mean I, I always think that two seats are you know two eyes and two brains are better than one and um i yeah i did feel quite strongly that uh, that, that, that two blokes in an airplane was much much better th th than one and it was interesting that the um u.s marines went in for two aircraft in their uh, in their f-18s um I, I don't know, really. I mean, particularly, I guess, when we're getting into this business of having um, drones and that, intelligent wingmen or whatever they're called, um, or AI or whatever, then I don't know. Is, is it going to um, is it going to be um, a, a, within the workload of a single person or are you going to need somebody else? My, my own view is that, as I've just said, I would prefer to see two people in an airplane. I think it works much, much better. So, um, and but, but again, it goes down, I guess, to cost and similarly to what i said earlier on if you've got two seats that's that is literally two seats and all the kit that goes with it that's a hell of a lot of weight so you have to you know tie, uh, toss up the difference of <clears throat> do you have the technology to, uh, to to solve the problem you know for, for one man or do you need two one man one person shall we say uh, or do you actually need two 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 people in there <clears throat> um and well, we've got th another one from from Hakenheim, which I'll just quickly go through, which was was the tornado relatively better in the air to ground roll compared to the air to air roll? <clears throat> I think undoubtedly it was. I mean, that's really what it was designed to do. Um, the air to air roll, we know it got off to a pretty bad start with F2 and the initial days of F3, but I think towards the end, I mean, the F3 was it was a uh, you know very very capable aeroplane, um, excellent radar, really good. Um, um, jaded and stuff like that giving you really good um, sa and uh, a really good weapon suite as well so towards the end it was a, a fantastic machine but it was always going to be uh, um slightly hobbled by the fact that it, the airframe was um, as, as i've already said was optimized for low level so when you're operating medium level it was it was less than ideal for that so uh, whereas tornado uh, ground mud moving 
yeah, it was all done basically so initially at low level for what it was designed for and um, later on um the the way that the, the weapon systems were didn't need you to be desperately maneuverable or anything else so so yeah it did undoubtedly it was a great air to mud machine not such a good in uh, in the big picture air to air machine um <clears throat> we've got golf um 7723 it said did you always want to fly, go and fly the tornado and the answer is no <laughs> uh, no actually the thing that i wanted to do was to, I wanted to fly the fan Phantom, would you believe? And that's kind of what got me. So it's a big picture of a phantom on on my on the, the wall in my room. Um, but I thought when I got down to the tactical weapons unit and started the low level flying, um, that that's what I really enjoyed and that's what I was best at really. Um, and also flying the Hawk was a relatively easy airplane to fly. I, I, I was quite keen to fly a, a sort of modern technology airplane. So it was while I was there at um, uh, a, a Chivna flying on the tactical weapons course that uh, I changed my mind really thought yeah i do i do want to tornado is what i want to do and and having gone that way you know i don't regret it it was a fantastic machine and, and, and i thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed flying flying it um we've got uh oh, we've got uh Harkin Eggman again would an upgraded tornado be able to survive a near peer or peer to peer conflict of today i think yeah it depends on how you're going to use it um as ever with these things um you, know, you need to, to suit the the the, the tactics to the capabilities of the machine. Um, if you're looking for a, a low level penetrator, that's the aeroplane to go for. If you're up at, at medium level, then as long as it's got, um, you know, reasonably good um, seed, taking out um, enemy um, system uh, systems, and um, if, you, if you've got fighter escorts to take out enemy fighters, it, it, you know, if, if you can kind of um, achieve some sort of air superiority, again, yeah, it, it, I think it'd be great. Um, but again, within the limitations I've already said, if you're going to go up. Uh, and fly around at medium level in an aeroplane, which is basically optimised and completely designed to be a low-level aeroplane. Um, I've got uh, the freckle poony here, which says, ever used JP-233 or fired an alarm? If so, what was it like? And the answer, I'm sorry to say, is neither of neither of the above. Um, the, I have spoken to people who have done it, though. Um, what they said about the um, uh, flying with, with JP-233 is that it was like going very fast over a sort of cobbled... Uh, street as, as the munitions came out again you know, bang 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 still came out and then at the end of it there was two, two no, I think there was three massive great bangs as the um, the, the, the actual weapon um, containers were, were, were jettisoned from the airplane um, which also gave I think a fairly big pitch up as well um, to the airplane as well as it, as it suddenly got very lighter um, so I think that that was the the, the abiding memories that the guys have, uh, who flew and, and dropped and said uh, in terms of um, alarm I've, I've i've fired an aim line um sidewinder and i think that's probably very you know a rocket's a rocket basically i think alarm basically you, you fired it and it went streaking off and then uh, then sort of did a sort of turn up towards the heavens and disappeared into the distance now my memory of uh firing an aim nine um off the um the wing pylon was this thing which i mean the missile's not very big but as it goes past your mac whatever it is three or plus or whatever it is that it's done in you know, within within its own length um uh, with a whole lot of um smoke coming out the back it is very much like it you can imagine a sort of steam locomotive going past you at a, you know 100 miles an hour or something uh th this thing i've never seen anything move so fast in my life it's absolutely amazing seeing it it just went woof um and i imagine that firing alarm would be very very similar in indeed to that um We've got um, Hark Name again. Oops. Uh, it was your it was your tornado the first choice to fly? I think I've kind of already answered that. Really, yeah. Yes, I wanted to fly Phantom, but I realised as I got to the stage where I had to make a decision that the tornado was the first choice, and um, yeah, and and, I, and I'm very pleased that, that it was too. Um, the I've got Timberwolf asking, have you? any red flag or otherwise interesting notable tales from the blue v blue training yeah i mean red flag was fantastic i did it um did it well red stroke green flag i think about four times in the end um and it, it i mean it was unbelievable because we were um again hugely in, into low level flying and so we were cleared down to 100 feet and 100 feet at 400 500 knots is jolly exciting <laughs> the the earth moves whistling past you um tiny little sort of uh, lumps of ground suddenly became really you know um really important you could hide behind them if you if you're being locked up by by missile systems and things like that and the, the whole experience is absolutely fantastic i mean to go off and, and um 
pit yourself against the various um, you know, genuine weapon, weapon systems, um, you know, dropping sometimes live weapons, but um, against realistic targets was absolutely fantastic. I mean, that said, um, having, you know, by the time we got to about the fourth time, it was um, because the the area, although it's quite big, isn't massive in comparison to, let's say, Europe. So you've kind of seen most of it because the the, the constraints of, of of the airspace mean you have to sort of go in one way and come out another way, and, and that's basically it. You can do it, do it you know, clockwise or anti-clockwise kind of thing. So um, so that that was all great. But yeah, having done it four times, it, it was absolutely fantastic. And it was kind of boys' own fun, really, rooting around at ultra low level, ultra high speed um firing off um chaff and um um and flares and things and uh generally speaking getting the better of of, of, of the um the ground systems um and uh, you know able to, to dodge some of the air to air stuff as well so yeah brilliant 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 fun and great training and that kind of got us into you know when you think of all the stuff that's gone on over the last uh, few you know last 20 odd 30 odd years really i guess um very very used to the american way of of, of, of fighting and fitting into to, to, to that um I got a friendly rivalry between Tornado Buccaneer F-111 crews. Uh, yeah, always. I mean, in terms of uh, Tornado and F-111, we kind of, um, w- yeah, I think we were kind of swing-wing brothers, really. So there, there, there was a bit of a sort of uh, fear living of, of the brethren. But yeah, friendly rivalry, um, but equally well, very pleased to see you know, each other doing well. Um, the We didn't really get to meet them very much. I mean, Red Flag is a classic case um, of, of, of where we did. And, um, yeah, well, I think we, each of us was quite impressed with what, what the other could get up to really um i should say that one of my mates from actually from airline flying days i still keep in touch with is uh, an x111 driver so we quite often swapping stories about what we got used to go up to in that and we've got big in sorry biggles tintin here saying what aircraft do you think would make a good replacement for the t2 hawk for training yeah do you know i I've, it's not something that i've put much thought into really um the the t2 is a great machine um i've i've only looked around the outside of it um, well, actually, I've sat in the cockpit, to be honest with you, as well, but I've not actually flown it. Um, I gather it's a very different machine to the the T1. The T1 was fantastic. I mean, it was the sports car of, of the skies. It was absolutely brilliant, um, brilliant fun to fly. It was very manoeuvrable. Um, what it didn't have, which T2 has, is, is, is the... Um, ability to put in sort of false well, um, sort of simulated radar um, stuff. So, again, it depends what you're going to use it for, really, because um, to my mind, the, the basic stuff that, that we were taught and did in the Hawk with a map and a stopwatch and looking out the window was just sort of set it set you up for almost anything, whereas now they're using it as a bit of a kind of lead in for, for Typhoon. Um, and whilst it makes sense to try and do as much of that training as you can on, on, on a relatively cheap aeroplane, um, it also, do you really, you know, wouldn't you be better off doing the fancy stuff in the fancy airplane that has got all the kit as opposed to just a kind of emulator? Um, so the question or the answer is I, I really don't know because I haven't haven't really thought about it very much. But um, something something very similar, perhaps a Hawk T3 might be the answer to that one. Um, I've got uh, Timberwolf says, what is your best possibly beer related, but also otherwise best anecdote from serving abroad with other forces? whether wartime or peace oh do, I, do you know it's one of those you get ask a question like that on the hoof and it's difficult to uh to, to think of something off off the top of uh, off the top of, of my head um i'm uh, i just trying to think we, 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 with um with other forces um and i did we did actually um do an exchange with the italians in um they were at Gady, which is just a, just near Milan, uh, flying F-104. And um, so we arrived there. And the first thing that we did was to we, we were to get airborne as a three ship of tornadoes and meet up with uh, two starfighters. And they would then fly around the um, or, or, or go with us as we flew around the mountains just to the the north of that area. So up around it, it, it takes you up towards uh, Mont Blanc um, and then um, uh, the I can't remember what it's called now, uh, Monte Rosa and that kind of area, and that, then down into uh, um, uh, in, into the lakes. Um, and we got airborne. And the first thing was that one of the, um, the uh, w- w- one of the um, starfighters went US and had to land, and the other guy was then uh, 
was then airborne and given that they were air defense fighters and we were going around in circles and they knew exactly where we were it was quite embarrassing to see that they took ages to actually find us um and when we did we managed to make it to the mountains and then the guy ran out of fuel and that was him gone so uh, yeah um i also got a backseat ride in a cf-18 um we did an exchange with the canadians who were down at baden solingen um and what they got a, a two-seater which they bought to give us all rides and what i hadn't realized was that um when I, I was said, yeah, you've got the next trip, was that they'd also promised it too. Now, we had this huge, great um, uh, panda bear thing, stuffed panda bear thing in the uh, in, in our crew room, which none of us took much notice of. But it, apparently back in the day, it had been hugely important and used to fly a lot and had this had its own logbook. Um, and what I didn't realise when I got into the back of the F-18 was that they decided that the the panda was to fly in the same thing. So I got back in the thing and had this huge, huge great panda bear <laughs> hanging on to it. So I was sort of looking over its shoulder to see where we were going. Um, uh, eventually, when we got in, but I managed to stuff it down the back of the side of the seat so I could see out. But that was the time we went down into um, Area 7, which was down in South Germany, um, at, with this as a pair of, of Hornets. And... Um, our two ace pilots looked on the screens and saw a couple of airplanes coming their way. So they thought, right, right we'll have them. And um, they, so they split and then they started hooking in. And as they just they, they hooked in, they had a quick roll wings over to see if there were any trailers. And there were, because the, these the two airplanes they'd seen were the front of this great big gorilla of all the guys from the tactical leadership program. So all of NATO's finest pilots all lined up <laughs> watching these two F-18s come right in front of them, right in missile range. So it's all a bit embarrassing, really. Um, but that's the best I can do there for the moment. Um, but let's have a quick look and see. We've got um, the Freckle Party says, was it unnerving on your first low level night flight to rely on the automated systems such as TFR and the answer yeah it was actually um, it was a great sort of leap a, a, a leap in faith really to do that um, but it was actually a very it was an excellent system it was really good and it, it, it did very very quickly um, get your confidence and you kind of really did feel that it was um, you know that, that, that it did a great job and it was actually um, you know um, it was going to keep you safe, but also it was driving you around at low level, um, you know, at night where you couldn't see anything else. Um, and, it, and it was brilliant. And I did a couple of other trips. I mean, some one memorable one was in um, Sardinia, where we uh, the way, we were there for, for weapon training but, uh, on the, the range at um, we're at Deci Manu, uh, on the range, range at Capo Frasca, and the weather was crap. So we we launched to do a sort of a, a singleton um, TF. Um, uh, sort of cross-country navigation and off we went and it was the weather was rubbish and we bounced around all over the place and we we're in and out of clouds but also in and out of mountains and god knows what else and it was brilliant actually you go along you suddenly you, know, you see his cliff face go past you as the airplane sort of just went up past it and round it and the, and it coped very well and um, the other thing of course we got into quite complex um formations um, using the tfr um you know four ships and things quite quite happily and so we go off with you know and, and at not, you know in the clear skies you'd look and you'd see all the airplanes you know, you'd see the flashing lights of them all um, and then we'd all go into cloud or whatever and then you fly around a bit and then a bit later on you pop out again and you look around and you see everybody in formation still so that was really actually i i, I got a real buzz from that um bizarrely i mean it was um you know you you put your faith in the machine but the machine was was brilliant and it was great just to sort of be there and, and see it all happen and you know you obviously hand was ready to take control if if, if, the, if it wasn't coping but um no it was, it, it was really really good actually um the um biggles tintin says without refueling and uh, fuel bags what was the average flight time of uh, uh, the gel one um so in we used to fly actually with two under fuselage sorry under fuselage under wing tanks um and that would give you about an hour 45 at low level um in germany if you were clean you're probably talking about um I guess probably about just under an hour. Probably, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think back to because we used to fly them clean, you know, no, no pods, no uh, no tanks, um, at uh, Cottesmore at the um, at the Trinational Tornado Training Establishment, the Triple E, and I think most of the sorties there were about yeah, yeah we're about about an hour. Um, you used more at um, uh, in an operational fit because you had pylons and and um, pods and that, which gave quite a lot of drag. So that that meant you you burnt more fuel. But um, yeah, certainly an hour forty five at low level with 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 um, yeah two tanks on. You, we could carry a third tank and uh, that would give you probably another sort of twenty minutes something like that at low level. Um, or if we go high low high, um, that would get you an hour into. So three tanks would get you an hour to. Um, at medium level down probably about 20 minutes 
it's worth a low level and an hour transit back in. So we used to do that quite, quite a lot as well. Um, the what have we got now? Um, ever suffered a bird strike in a tornado or a hawk? That's a answer yes, both. <laughs> the um, quite a few actually. Um, the tornado um I, in fact on my, one of my first trips in germany we we're flying along and we used to fly around at, most of germany was a 500 all of germany was a 500 foot low level uh, low flying area um and then there were other areas we could drop down to 250 feet so but most of it you fly around at 500 feet but the only problem was that the buzzards in germany tend to fly around at 500 feet um and I, I remember going along and just because you see these things at the last second and this enormous bang as it hit the nose and um, it, we actually diverted into Hopson. It didn't appear to do any other damage. So we, we popped into um, Hopson and when we got out and looked at the nose, there was a huge great panel that had been ripped off, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, probably, um, you know, four or f four foot by probably, you know, by, by two foot sort of panel being ripped off the nose where it, where it hit it. Um, I, I, we did it. I had, I had hit a few others. I remember flying around um, again in a tornado. Um, we were just between Malvern and um, Breeden Hill um, one evening and, and on one of these, in fact, one of the high, low, high missions, you know, sort of uh, where, where I mentioned you got your hours transit uh, to 30 minutes low level and hours back again. Um, and so uh, we hit this bird and, and you can tell if it goes down the engine because cause the um, the air conditioning comes off the engine and you can smell it's like roast chicken. So you get a smell of roast chicken. Go, oh, obviously that's gone down the engine. So we were there. We could we, we, we thought, where should we go? And we could go into various places. And in the end, um, that were pretty much equidistant and i thought oh, we will go to lynham uh, because I, i'd got a mate there who said oh if, you, if you're passing by drop into lynham sometime we'll go for a beer so we uh we, we called up lynham and we landed and it wasn't until we actually parked the airplane uh, and looked outside that i saw that everybody else was wearing gas masks or the, and we landed in the middle of an exercise and, oh no that's a really stupid thing to do but um well, what we discovered was we went to the mess and we then um i rang my mate up who who lived outside and he said well if you walk to the main gate i'll pick you up and we'll go to the pub uh, but of course all we had to wear was our flying suits so the long short of it was we went to the local pub dressed in our flying suits and drank lots of beer so there we go uh hawk yeah um, the, the hawk was a much um uh, it, it wasn't quite as robust an airplane of course and it only had one engine so uh, it was a bit of a bad business if, if you did hit a bird i just remember having one i think one particular bird site where there was a big bang and it actually hit the canopy it luckily didn't come in but there's a big sort of red smear across the canopy, but I didn't know where it had gone after that. So that on that type of particular occasion, I think I diverted into Shawbury um, to uh, to land there and and and, um, and get out the airplane while, while we still could. Um, let's have a quick look at the uh, so. Um, John Minter says, did any of the tornadoes you flew operationally have nose art? And uh, no, they didn't actually. Um, we. Uh, well, actually, in a way, they, they did. I, when I, I wasn't out during the Gulf War itself, but I was out there afterwards for the um, operating in the no-fly zone. And um, we it was Christmas, actually. We turned up on Christmas Day to, to do to do fly our sortie. And um, <clears throat> looked up, there's somebody painted uh, sort of line drawing of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer with a message of Merry Crimbo under the, under them. Um, I'm not quite sure how long they, they stayed on for. But, uh, yeah, that was it, really. All the airplanes when they came back from the Gulf War, all got repainted in the green and grey camouflage and uh, all the, the nose art was uh, was painted out. Um, they did actually keep the bomb markings along, alongside the cockpit. So you get an airplane with you know, a lot of bomb markings alongside of it, um, showing what they got up to during, during the Gulf War. Um, I, John Minter says, which tornado squadrons did I fly with? And I was on 14 Squadron and 31 Squadron, uh, both at Bruggen. So I joined 14, if I, I joined 14 designate squadron when it, first uh, was equipping with tornado and then we became 14 squadron um i then so i did that for two and a bit years then moved across the the wing at bruggen to 31 squadron um had a great time there and then after my uh, brief tour as a tactics instructor on the hawk i came back to bruggen back to 14 squadron um so I, i've done that twice um and, uh, and a fine squadron it was too um i've got jungle 80 sorry johnny jungle 80 what was your scariest moment in the tornado well, there were two of them, actually. They're both the same thing. Um, during, back in the day, the tornado had a real problem um, with rear fuselage fly, fires. 
and basically the back end of the airplane would catch fire and um, it would then burn through all the controls and then the airplane would <laughs> would basically nose down and crash um, and so you had to jump out and um, the one of the um, symptoms of this was the um, the APU, uh, sorry, power unit, which was at the sort of back um, on the right hand side of the airplane, uh, had a fire loop in it, and uh, that usually got burnt through first. And so the first indications was you've got an APU caption in flight because it's only supposed to work on the ground. But um, but but if this caption came on in flight, then that was an indication that you had a rear fuselage fire and you need to get on the ground within probably the next five ten minutes, or you you know you, the airplane was going to uh, to crash. And so um, I was. I, one, one again, pleasant balmy evening. We dropped down uh, near the wash. We're going into the weapons range at Donna Nook, and um, just as we we're about to join the range, suddenly there's this sort of uh, the cat, you know, um, attention getters going, um, uh, the, the um, noise in, uh, in 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 the headsets, the lyrebird warning, and uh, this red caption came up: APU fire. And I don't know, I think both myself and my NAV, Steve, I think we both nearly shat ourselves when we saw that. And uh, it was, it was oh, my God, this can't be for real. Um, and so we pulled up, put out a Mayday call. And luckily, we were kind of almost about 20 miles out from Coningsby. So we just pointed the airplane at Coningsby and um, did a straight in approach. You know, I think both of us, I think certainly he had his hand on the ejection seat, how close we were on our way in there uh, to pull us both out of the thing suddenly um <clears throat> lurched forward um but yeah i think we're both of us kind of we're really quite worried actually poor steve had jumped out of an airplane i think about six months previously so i think he was bricking it uh so we landed um and we actually discovered that um it wasn't a rear fuselage fire at all <laughs> great to know it was um some oil had got into the um into the apu compartment and that had actually um done something to the firewire uh, which had set it off um, <clears throat> imagine my surprise when, uh, I don't know, probably about a year later, I was at low level in the Ardennes area. And actually, we were setting up, we were the bounce for a, a, a 2v1 sortie. And so we, we'd set us up and we'd just seen the, the, the other pair coming uh, coming across. And we were setting up this beautiful intercept um, just right on the beam as we came steaming in. Suddenly, <laughs> again, attention getters, liars. APU red caption. Oh my God! I thought, well, the, the chance of getting two of them, which are spurious, is absolutely zero. So it's got to be the real thing. And um, we were actually um, uh, uh, quite close to Liège Airport, and so again, made a call, called up, and uh, they started pointing us directly towards the Liège Airport, which involved going over the city. Uh, so I said, no, I think we need to go round it because I'm not sure the airplane's going to keep flying for that long. Uh, so we went round the city and, uh, and and plumped ourselves onto the runway. Um, and guess what? It was another oil leak into the APU. So it, that was a spurious one as well. But at the time, we, we didn't know that. And at the time, both of those times, I was actually convinced I was about to jump out of the airplane. So those those are the scary times. Um, the um, Let's all look. Oh, John says, by the way, your book's excellent. Thank you very much, John. That's very good. Very kind of you. Uh, okay, we've got Ark. Ark and, oop, hang on, we've lost him again. I'll be back in a minute while I fiddle around with this. Um... Right. Hark and Engman says, question, are two engines more important in regards to flight safety for attack aircraft compared to air-to-air -air focused aircraft? Approximately how often do tornadoes have to limp back on one engine? I think... Yeah, you know, in general, two engines are a better one because it's um, you know, that's why airlines have got two engines because it, it gives you some flexibility. It gives you some, um, you know, the ability to lose one. Uh, and these days, I mean, back in the day, if you had two engines, when one went, the other one would just fly you to the point where you're going to crash. But uh, these days, airplanes fly around quite happily on one engine. Um, and I just think if you've got two, then uh, you know that's uh, it, it's a bit of redundancy. So, so my view is that it's always good to have two engines. Um, clearly. Things like F-16 have only got one, but there again, you know, airplanes after you look at F-15, well, F-14, uh, F-18, <clears throat> we're into kind of two twin-engined airplanes. I think probably for, for, for that reason, actually. Um, and plus, as engines have got smaller and, and, and more powerful, um, you can have two engines and you can have a huge amount of power uh, with Typhoon as well, not a particular case in, put, in point. Um Beagle Stinton, did you ever fly in the Falklands? And if so, was it a good experience? No, I didn't. I never went there, actually. Um, so I'm afraid I can't answer that one at all. Guys who did, I think, thoroughly enjoyed it, particularly guys on the Phantom, because um, it was basically licensed hooligans, and there was no, um, I think there were, there, there were virtually no rules. Um, in fact, that one guy, he had a, uh, a wire strike. The wire was an aerial, and um, it was the aerial was, I think, about 15 foot off the ground. So there you go. Um, so, yeah, all good, all good fun. Um, 
Uh, how daunting was it being on QRA and the tactical nuclear role? So this is Mike Childs has asked this question. Um, did you ever feel that actual conflict might be an immediate possibility? Yeah, it, do you know what? It was very daunting. It really was. It was a very uh, sobering moment when you uh, walked into the, well, first of all, you, you, you met your armed policeman who you introduced yourself to, who um, <clears throat> who basically was guarding the 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 the, um, <clears throat> the the shelter but going in there and seeing a genuine bomb attached to the airplane was quite a daunting moment and that was your bomb you signed up for it you you, you signed it and that was yours for for 24 hours <clears throat> you had your target it um and uh, you kind of memorize that or and 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 and, and, and sort of remind yourself it was all in a big folder and um basically having having picked up your folder and signed for your, for your airplane it's bomb you then spent 24 hours waiting for World War Three to start. And do you know what? I, yeah, I did. I think we all thought that it, that it could quite possibly start. I think we all believed that. Um, the, uh, um, and, I, you know, I, I, I can still remember where my target was. And in fact, oddly enough, I was looking at it on Google Earth the other day. <clears throat> it's all a bit overgrown now. But, um, yeah, it's all, it all, you know, I remember all the features down the, you know, down the attack run and everything else. Um, so, yeah, it was very, very real. And you did feel a real sense of... Um, um, uh, uh, that you're doing something really, really worthwhile, I think, um, and, and a real sense of responsibility. So, yeah, I, I mean, I can't say it, it well, was, you know, the first time was fun and then it became a pain in the ass, to be honest. But but nevertheless, it was, you know, you can see that it's a very, very important thing that you're doing um, and uh, that it had to be you know, done faultlessly. And um, no, it was... It was um, it, so answer yes, it was daunting, <laughs> and and we did feel that it might indeed be. I mean, yeah, we did. We really did think that it, that it might happen. I mean, at that stage, uh, we the exercises. There'd be probably about one or two exercises a month, and they'd go off at sort of one o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning, and you'd race into work, and you wouldn't know if it was real or exercise. So excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, it really was. Um, it it really did seem that the Russians were going to were come, and, and, and we were ready for them. So um, you know, it's it, it was all good stuff. Um, I've got uh, the Freckle Puny asks, do you, how do you feel about the F-35B as a partial tornado replacement and are there enough of them being purchased? Answer, well, do you know what? I think that the F-39A or C would have been a better idea, really. F-39B, you know, carrying your own extra engine that you don't really need um, and just so you can fit on a ship that you don't really need to be on. Um, you know, great for the Navy, but not not for us because tornado was, a you know, it, it's supposed to be a you know, sort of long range airplane and you want as much you know to carry loads of weapons or loads of you to where to where you're going to drop your weapon so there's no point in carting around a um you know completely needless um uh, lift engine so i don't think it is a, a replacement particularly or a particularly effective one should we say um but there we go are there enough of them i think the answer is no really i mean if you think of the you know of, of the threat that we're up against at the moment if you think that back in the day uh, we had what 12 13 Tornado GL1 squadron at, the, at its height, um, and now we're down to basically one. If, if we say the Navy squadron is going to be on on the carrier, then in fact probably probably the other one's going to be as well. But you know, one um, squadron of F-35s that might be used, and a small squadron at that. I mean, bear in mind, I can't remember they've got. I think got about 12 on a squadron. We used to have well, if it's a 15 aircraft on the, on a tornado squadron. Um, <clears throat> so you know, they really don't have. The wherewithal spares enough airplanes so no so the answer is i don't feel good about it and uh, are there of them no there aren't um have have i ever done training over galloway in scotland i'm going to tell you uh, uh, an angle blasting over our farm and i was in the middle of the rare uh, all right yeah <laughs> was it me i'm not sure actually but um <clears throat> Yeah, we did loads of flying around there, and uh, uh, there that area actually is a um, it's a hundred foot a tactical uh, training area. So we if we were, were working up to go out to to Red Flag, we'd do quite a lot of flying around there, um, and 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 fly, and then through um, and back in the day we used to go through then out to the the range at Jerby Head at the, the, the top of the Isle of Man. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I um, I don't remember seeing a bloke with red hair in, in a farm um, farm as we went blasting over but it's funny that you did as you flew around you know all over the world was flashing past you just get glimpses and certain things would kind of just stick in your mind um and i i can remember going down a road and, and noticing a woman pushing a pram one day that probably got shock of her life i can remember actually <clears throat> early one morning because we come from germany at high level and drop down uh, flying it was it was actually further in north scotland actually flying down this lock at like, 100 feet and there was a guy just opening the door of a caravan <clears throat> 
in first thing in the morning, having just sort of woken up and he's opening his, the door of a caravan before you know, with his cup of coffee in his hand. And um, because of the way that the, you know, it was, it was slightly, uh, the, the banks were, were slightly higher on the water level, I think we kind of looked at each other in the eye as I went past. <clears throat> but yeah, it was, it, it was, it was amazing. The little bits, you, you just get these little sort of thing, clips here and there of things that you see, little pictures in your mind as, as you went racing past. Um, uh, furthermore, I said a pilot broke the sound barrier and it was in a local paper two days later. No, I don't know who did that. <clears throat> um, and we it, actually, it was, it was, it was I, I never did it, but well, I, I did go supersonic myself because we did it kind of over the North Sea. Um, and if we were doing um, a Detchi Mamani, we used to do the uh, air combat um, instrumentation range, you'd quite often do it there just for fun. Um, but I did nearly do it one day actually when i was doing my initial training through the, the tornado using the train following radar um <clears throat> the tornado had an auto throttle thing where you could so you're going to fly at 420 knots you, you set it up you press 420 420 and you, you, you the throttles would do their own thing <clears throat> but unfortunately if they went to the full uh, either up to fully um dr full dry power or back to idle they the thing then tripped out <clears throat> this particular day we were going up to uh, we were kind of going up a hill slightly and, and it went to full power, which and I didn't notice that the autothropple had, had tripped out. And then as we came down the other side, we were going down a hill. And of course, we were then going full power down this hill at low level. And the hint to me that things were not quite as they should be is I could hear this deep sound of like an organ uh, pipe going, boo, which was a shock wave just forming just on the canopy. So luckily I managed to pull the throttles back. And uh, just before we went supersonic over Maltby or somewhere in North Yorkshire, um, we, we, we luckily didn't <laughs> um we've got uh, harkin uh england asked another question were the attack variants of the gr variants of the tornado quite similar in the different countries where the tornado was served um <clears throat> no i don't th well I, I think the basic airframe was um but the, the the extra kit that was put in was probably different i know the germans for example had a different e-scope to well they didn't have an e-scope actually which is which is the thing we had to look at the um what the terrain following radar was seeing uh, they had a repeater of the ground mapping radar on the back of the airplane which the navigator had and this was because i think uh, most of the guys were ex uh, starfighter pilots of course they were used to looking at their own radar picture so they wanted to see it um <clears throat> we had different electronic warfare countermeasure kit we had the boz 107 chaff and flare pod and we had the sky shadow pod whereas i think the germans uh I think they had NLQ 101, I think, but I'm not sure, or something like that. I'm not sure what the Italians had. Um, we we had different um, radar warning kit. We had RHWR. I think they had our electronica, RWR. So I'm, I'm not sure what else they had that was different. But but I think, was, uh, and also we had the laser um, rangefinder and marked target routine. Um, uh, seeker which they didn't have as well so so they were quite different in in many respects although the basic airframe and i guess the basic capabilities are pretty much the same really um we've got um william reed oh, yeah turn of <laughs> red tornado the target is fantastic thank you very much indeed um we've got um i'm just gonna uh, put these uh, yeah here we go um okay well, another question what was the minimum altitude for an ejection? Well, it was a zero zero seat. So, I mean, theoretically, if you sat on the ground at no feet, <laughs> you could uh, pull the handle and off you'd go. Um, but the um, if you had a rate of descent on, then um, I, I, you know, I think if you're going at 1,000 feet a, a minute rate of descent, you could probably probably about 100 feet, probably about minimum that. If you're much below that, it probably wasn't going to you're probably going to hit the ground before anything else. But again, it just depended on the um, on, on the trajectory of the flight path and which way you were pointing. Um, you know, the, the um, just the way i mean there was a mid-air in the lake district where <clears throat> the guys hit a jaguar uh, and the jaguar pilot was killed and the guys jumped out and the only reason that they were alive was because they jumped out on top of the hill and as uh, where, yeah, where they were rejected <clears throat> excuse me the um the hill fell away so so their seats which would have gone straight into the ground actually sort of fell free and uh, and, and they got away with it um so that was max recommended uh, sorry speed <clears throat> i think it was supposed to be available at all speeds so um I, 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 having read john nichols book about ejection the horror stories about really high speed stuff you probably wouldn't want to do it but there again if you've got to go you've got to go I and mean, it was an emergency thing um, but we did have uh, arm restraints and leg restraints which, which would have were due to pull you in uh yeah so you didn't have flailing limbs and sort of start dislocating and breaking legs and, and arms um, I guess the question is what what would have happened to your head? Your head would have gone back into the the, the, the box, I suppose, where the parachute was. But with, you know, if you, if you were looking around or something, yeah, I think you could have your neck snapped. So, um, and I think probably people did. So yeah, that that was the danger. I 
and get at, at high speed. Um, we've got uh, how does U.S. Navy? Uh, sorry, Timball says how does U.S. Navy commanders talking about unidentified contacts affect you? Bay. Um, I. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know, actually. I, I, I'm not, I've never actually worked with the US Navy, so I, I honestly don't know how that, how that would work. Um, so I'm sorry about that one. <laughs> um, is the GL1, Trash Cutter says, GL1 same as a German IDS tornado. Um, I kind of, uh, in, in some respects, already answered that in that it's, it, it, it's certainly the same airframe, but with some different mods. And I think if we're talking about the, the ECR version, it probably had lots of different kit in it that, um, th that I'm not aware aware of and, and um, it's probably a desperate secret anyway so you know airplane air, airframe basically the same engines basically the same but the, um, the, the the fancy kit in it probably different and I guess you know once you've got to GR4 that's probably very different again from 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 what the Germans have got um, just a fun, funniest moment sorry John, uh, Johnny Jungle 80 says um, yeah what, what was the funniest moment flying in the RAF um I tell you, it's, it's difficult actually. I think probably one of the funniest was again it was a backseat rise in another aeroplane. Uh, it was in a Harrier, and um, we had just started uh, flying the tornado. And at that stage, the inertial nav system used to take something like um, half an hour to align. So you'd go out to the airplane, sit there for half an hour, the thing aligned itself. Later, we discovered it didn't need all that. But anyway, that's what it did. And um, we were there with a couple of Harrier pilots who were there to give us, uh, to, you know, as, as an opposition. And of course, the Harriers got. I think much like the Hawk, you get in, you switch it on and off you go 30 seconds later. And um, so the Harrier pilots, again, I was due to fly in at the back of a T4. Um, so I was strapped into it. And then the Harrier pilots went out. And while the tornado crews were strapping in, they sort of stood there with, with cups of coffee in front of the tornado line, sort of chattering away and looking very, very casual. And eventually when the tornado taxied and literally the last one had gone past, they had suddenly dropped to the coffee cups, jumped in the, in the Harriers, pressed the button, started, and then taxied out right behind the, the tornadoes. But when we were then got airborne uh, into this, it was a 4v2, um, <laughs> we ended up at one stage with this this tornado started getting behind us and uh, my mate in the front said, here, watch this, at which point, I'm not quite sure what he did, and I don't think he does either, but um, I think it was a bit of viffing or something like that. But the next thing we knew, it was all I knew, was him saying, oh shit as the airplane started tumbling <laughs> head <laughs> tail overhead it's sort of going like this it certainly wasn't flying i think it was just sort of ballistically tumbling and eventually he got it back under control again um but we had a bit of a laugh about that i have to say it was quite funny um the timberwolf did you have any funny interactions with intercepted russian bombs no i didn't we were strictly um, air to ground and um, so didn't and do you know what? I'd never came across the Russians at all um, the nearest I got was the um, the Czechs and the Czechoslovakian Air Force sent some airplanes over in 1991 I think oh, 90 yeah 1991 <clears throat> to the air show circuit and they ended up at Chivna and they got um, a fulcrum a um, uh, what was it an L39 trainer and an Antonov that was there that thing and we um and the, the, it rained and of course the rain got into the the fulcrum so that was put in a hangar and uh, you, you'd see it in the hangar and they had all these um somebody obviously been out to you know the mess wherever it is and got all, all these electric radiators so the whole hangar was full of these electric radiators on full blast and dry, dry this airplane out with all panels off um the l39 actually had a go in it we um <laughs> The, the pilot didn't speak any English and I obviously didn't speak any Czech. And um, we'd gone to the Met Brief and at China, being a coastal airfield, the um, the wind used to blow in from the uh, fr from the sea in the morning. You got sea breeze. And then in the afternoon, when, when the ground heated up, it then reversed. So you ended up, sorry, if it's the other way around. I think it started off um, um with a, a a land breeze and then you know, as, as the heating took place and, and everything switched around then you get a sea breeze and so we'd started at the, at the met brief um it was the uh, easterly runway going into the land so he's going to take off point and land so he hadn't spotted the runway had changed so we 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 taxied out going for the run runway and i was just trying to get older to tell him no no it's the wrong one um so of course he then got onto the on the radio and um was speaking to the radar controller who's in charge of the approach zone as opposed to the ground controller so it's a little bit chaotic really but um that so that was the nearest I ever came and in fact we ended up having a beer with these guys in the bar funny old thing and the radio operator who's the one guy who spoke english um i we, we had a beer and i said cheers you know it's great to see you and just think you know, a few years ago we'd have been perhaps you know we, we could have been at war with each other and he looked at me and said 
Yeah, the Russians would have been well, but I don't think we would. <laughs> so there you go. Um, but the Freckle Bunny asks, how easy or otherwise would it have been to convert from the T uh, uh, Tornado Gel One to the F3? I think um, very easy in terms of flying the aeroplane, and some guys did it and enjoyed it. Um, I think it was a the F3 had a bit more oomph to it. I think it was a bit cleaner, had slightly lighter controls. But otherwise, it was all pretty much the same. And really, the only question is the specifics of the air-to-air -air role, the air, air combat. Uh, I'm used to it, 1v1 air combat in, in the tornado, but I mean radar combat and that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, fighting big formations. So that, that would be different, very different from what we used to get up to. So um, <clears throat> the difficulty wouldn't be flying the airplane. The difficulty would be in the change of role, really. Um, and but I say guys did it, guys guys enjoyed it. I think they, they came both ways. Uh, John Meter, are there any RF jets past or present that you'd like to fly? You, I, actually, I would love to have a go in a typhoon. Um, I, I'm told it's an airplane that you fly and uh, when you land, you smile, wraps around its uh, you, yeah, wraps around your face three times. Um, it does look a fun machine. Um, everybody I've seen flown it, so it's fantastic. So yeah, I, I quite fancy that. Other machines? No, not really. I think that um, I was lucky to fly both. Uh, the Hawk and uh, the Tornado, which were quite straightforward airplanes. So I didn't have any nasty vices. I think most most airplanes prior to those probably did have, you know, somewhere or other some nasty nasty vice that was going to kill you sooner or later. So I, you know, I, I don't feel I missed out there. Um, but yeah, I'd love to have a go on a Typhoon uh, to answer the question. Um, we got uh, can Eggman ask another question. Why does the US Air Force use different main technique technology for air to air refueling compared to everyone else in the world? Is it better or worse? Um, yeah, of course, they use the probe. Uh, uh, sorry, they, they, they use the, the um, yeah, probe um, uh, uh, system where uh, the, the airplane has the oh, sorry, boom and, uh, and receptacles. Uh, um, so the tanker has the boom that puts into the receptacle on the airplane. We do it the other way around. We have the probe that goes into the drogue, which is um, trailed by by the uh, the tanker airplane. Um, <clears throat> the the probe and drogue, which we use, I think we use because it, because it's simple because you can stick it on an, on pretty much any airplane you know, onto the victor for example the v10 for example um and, and um now the voyager and basically as long as you've got somebody you can reel the, the pod out and just keep an eye on what's going on behind you that's that's all you need um and the skill if you like is is in the for the pilot to actually fly the airplane into you know the the, the boom into the, uh, the the drogue sorry the probe into the drogue we'll get it right one day um so 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 that's the skill but it's pretty straightforward the reason the americans do it the other way i mean is that you if using the um the boom technique you can actually transfer an awful lot more fuel more quickly so although you can only put one airplane on the tanker at a time you can actually they need to spend less time on the tanker whereas if you're doing you know so so we go on with let's say two tornadoes and you know if you went behind a vc you know a vc 10 or a victor and filled up it, it would take the same time as if you one after the other from a, a kc10 let's say um so so i think that's the advantage i mean the other thing is that, that, that you need however to have a, a a boom driver who knows what he's doing so that's another skill which you know and uh, which needs to be trained which has a cost with it so i mean I, I guess we do it our way because it's cheapest and easiest and they do it their way because it's they've probably got the rolls royce solution um but um I, again I, having yeah, I, I, I was quite happy doing it the, the way we did. And actually, you know, it did give you a bit of a sense of um, a sense of achievement doing it, really. Um, perhaps rather pathetically. Um, the uh, what's the far? Sorry, this is Antonio uh, Vranic says the fastest you ever flown in the tornado. Um, I think I, I certainly went supersonic in it um, and at low level two because you could. And I don't know, probably about six or seven hundred knots. I don't remember actually kind of uh, marking it down really and going, oh, that's what it was. But yeah, that 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 kind of speed. Um, so quite quite fast. But um, yeah, I, I can't be specific, not because I'm being difficult, because I, I never actually bothered to record it. You know, so, yeah, oh, that's fast. Um, and, and, and that was it, really. Um, we've got uh, Hagen Engman. Did does the RAF have a reserve force? Is expected that members of flight crews to join reserves when exiting retirement, depending on age? No, it doesn't really. And I, I always think it probably should have done um, because, you know, particularly back in the day, with lots of people leaving with lots of skills, um, I think one or two people did were kind of on, on almost an individual basis. I think there were there were a handful of people who were kind of full time or reservists who would go up and <clears throat> do a bit of flying. But again, um, 
yeah not in the same way that the americans have the air national guard and i always thought that was that's a shame really because it you know it, it probably would be fun to do that every now and then keep your hand in and it would be an incredible amount of experience which you know, w- you know retained which would have, would have been useful um the um eric middleton what was your favorite ref station um I'm really biased here because my my two favourites were the two that I actually served on um, Bruggen because it was just fantastic the front line um, <clears throat> and I spent well God sort of nine pretty much nine years there actually off and on and um, it, and it was it was a great place and so you know like everywhere it sort of becomes home um, Chivna though was absolutely fantastic it was fantastic because it, it was tiny <clears throat> and you could walk around it you walk from a to b everybody knew who everybody else was um and it was um it was just a really and it's a lovely part of the world as well i mean that couldn't be said about bruggen that was a bit of a dump really in terms of uh, the bit of germany through holland that it was in uh, but chivna was absolutely f- idyllic I mean, it really was it was the it was the one place in the whole of the air force that everybody wanted to go um but for me you know it was just a, a lovely part of the world it was a great little station the flying there was fantastic and uh, it just ticked all the boxes really so yeah rf chivna for me i'd say is my, my, my favorite uh tim Wolf, did you ever fly night sorties with epic aurora borealis um <clears throat> yeah actually i I did fly a couple of times uh, with the aurora and not in the kind of epic ones um on in, the, in my tornado flying days, although bizarrely, I do remember seeing um, seeing it one one night. We, we, it was one of these night transits. We, we got airborne f- uh, from Bruggen and we were heading across to uh, to low fly in the UK. So we're in the, over the North Sea and suddenly there was this uh, aurora above us and it was just great to see it. It was you know, just a, we spent you know, 10 minutes just gazing up at it, thinking, wow, this is fantastic. Um, <clears throat> actually, oddly enough, Goose Bay, you would have thought, because it's up in Canada, you'd have thought there'd be lots of it. But no, I, I don't recall seeing the aurora while I, while I was up there flying we did sometimes on the ground um but then going back to my airline flying days i did see it quite a lot actually crossing atlantic um some some really quite spectacular um shows sometimes that you'd see which which really were brilliant i mean it, it, it's it's an awesome thing to see it really is um in fact the one i particularly remember was it, it was right we were right beneath it and as you looked up it was it was like um if you had sort of cling film above you and somebody putting their hand down on it like that so sort of different colors so it was it was brilliant um the freckle penny. What was the highest altitude you ever reached in a tornado? Um, <clears throat> I certainly got up to thirty-seven thousand feet. I think doing air combat in uh, Detchmano, which surprised the other side because they didn't think we were going to come in that high. I mean, the airplane wasn't ter- terribly interested in going much above twenty odd thousand feet, to be honest. Um, get around sort of in, in, in the sort of mid twenties, but yeah, that I think thirty-seven was probably the highest that, that I that I got um again i mean if you're going to sort of go ballistic and you know put the burners in and climb up and then sort of fall out um yeah you, you could probably get higher but in terms of actually flying along at um with a, re- a degree of control and the rest of it then uh, yeah 37 was, was the highest start that i managed to get up to uh, in the airplane um i can anyone ask, ask a, a question again is it still quite common for rf pilots to move across to flight airliners after exiting retiring yeah i think it is um it's it's a sort of a natural move if you like for for, for um let's say middle-aged pilots to uh, you know leave, leave the air force and, and trottle across to the airlines but of course there are fewer and fewer of them these days um so and there have been fewer opportunities in 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 civil aviation so um but yeah quite quite a normal thing uh, people do it people um you know do serve their time and say thanks very much indeed and now i'm going to fly airliners um the Timball says, what was our cheekiest flight? Did you ever blast country towns, houses on purpose for fun? Um, no, I can't say I was much more responsible than that. Um, we did actually, there was um, down uh, um, along sort of Surrey and Kent, there was what we call the stockbroker belt, which was full of, um, yeah, sort of red splodges that you can't fly. Well, you can't go there and if we ever did fly around there they're always complaining so every so often we used to from Brugge we get everyone we let down somewhere near, um, near Manston and just fly around there just because we could um <clears throat> but no what I uh, uh Chivner, again I used to fly the the weather ship and the hawk so we'd get um we met brief every morning and but they used to launch an airplane and it went off I can't remember what time it was but it would go at exactly um I don't know let's say it was eight o'clock whatever it is and you go at exactly eight o'clock and you, you smash off and then you fly around and you report on the cloud structure report on the low flying areas um and we used to um <clears throat> the, the the two things that we and the um the broadie weather jet used to do was we there, there was some there was a valley in in south wales um where there were a bunch of hippies had set up a sort of commune amongst the trees and so you 
is to go and wake up the hippies every morning at so you know you, you root over as dare, as low as you dare to go so there's probably a bunch of hippies somewhere who are probably desperately upset the fact that we used to to do, to do that but it's great fun i also used to go at hereford was where the um <clears throat> the ref administration uh, 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 section did their training so i always used to go there and just fly over it again as fast and as as, as loudly as i could every morning just to, to make sure that they knew what the airplane what the air force is all about <clears throat> John Minter says, are you working on any new books at the moment? Yeah, I am, actually. <laughs> so thank you for running up a dull evening for me in hospital. I hope you get well soon, mate, as I say. Um, yeah, I've, <clears throat> I've just, um, in fact, a couple have just gone to 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 the uh, to be edited. One of them's the, uh, the Jaguar in, uh, in action, which is quite interesting about the Gulf War, but also operations over Bosnia. I'm just coming to the end of one on um, called Over Cold War Seas, which is all about maritime and naval aircraft in the Cold War. And I've literally just started uh, my next uh, commission for Mosprey, which is to uh, do the Iraq War of 2003, the, the, you know, the, the air campaign there. So that, that so there, those, those are the next projects that, 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 that are there. Um, <clears throat> we've got uh, Paul Morgan, what type of navigation did you use? Uh, VOR? No, no. We um, we uh, it was all um, an inertial nav system. So we had an inertial nav which was uh, linked in uh, through a Coleman filter into a main computer. Um, we also had a Doppler and a couple of other feeds that went in to sort of cross check it. So that's what we did. We did have TACAN, and you did have to use the TACAN for your uh, instrument rating. <clears throat> and but when we were doing um, instrument approaches, we tended to have uh, well, we had an ILS, but we tended to do a precision uh, radar, uh, PAR, precision approach radar, so you got to talk down. So so that's that's sort of what we did there. Track of money, is the RAF too small? In my view, yeah, it is. I think it's, it is ridiculously small at the moment. Um, you know, I am biased because in my day, it was it was about, well, more than twice the size in terms of numbers and, you know, uh, 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 probably more than twice the size in terms of numbers of aircraft as well. So, yeah, I think it's, I think it's got too small now. And, and, and as the tasking has increased, you know, operational tasking, uh, the, the numbers have gone down so you know it, 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 that's a massive workload on on the guys who need to train who need to have time at home and all those things um we've got uh oops yeah i think that's 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 all i've got i think uh mike you've uh, you're there have you we got any yes more? i'm gonna <laughs> jump in here mike uh, i mean what an amazing q a and thank you all uh, to everyone who jumped in uh, with some great yeah, questions, but all the questions. Some re yeah, really good ones there. Yeah, some really good ones. Uh, but Mike, where can we find you online? Obviously, you're a prolific author, but uh, where else can we find you online? I think it, you're on Twitter or now X. Uh, is is it Mike N Books? That's right. Yeah, Mike. Yeah, Mike N Capital N Books um, at Mike N Books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm on. I'm on that. I put I put stuff on there every now and then, um, and quite a few things that we. Um, we follow um and um i'm also well I, I've, I've got a, a an author's page on on facebook which i put stuff in on every now and then so yeah you can find me there as well um i haven't yet got as far as instagram but maybe that'll happen but uh but i mean to, twitter twitter's the, the main thing that i use in terms of social media actually so uh, yeah so, so i'm on that and you and you can contact me there as well so uh, it's all there um, I've just had to see to a question there saying from Ray Carter saying any experience of the uh, English electric lightning um <clears throat> and the answer is have I got time to answer this, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Go for it, Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, do, I do actually, Ray. I've got a couple of, uh, of things. Firstly, um, when I finished um, at uh, Chivna as a, as a student, we stayed on for a little bit longer. And <clears throat> I got involved uh, or went up to Binbrook and we were doing um, some dissimilar com um, combat, which the Lightning Squadron, one of the Lightning Squadron, I can't remember which one it was now, I think it was 11, had, had organised. And it was, um, it was 2v2v2 with two Lightnings two hawks and two sea harriers and um the, the what would happen is that each pair would go off to a sort of um like a sort of mercedes sign thing we got to, to, to a spoke you know around a big circle and then we turn in and then all go to the center and then you know the fight would then begin as you merged and um it, it was great fun um uh, we, uh, literally, I was just sitting in the back because yeah, it, was, it was the staff guy in front was doing all the flying and fighting. But um, the one debrief I remember was this: uh, the lightning pilot saying, "Yeah, so I, I, I came in and I could see the I got a tally with the fight that was going on." 
So I could see my mate. And so I started closing towards him. And then as I got closer, I could see the sea area that was behind him. And then as I got closer, I could see the hawk that was behind the sea area. Because the hawk was such a small airplane, you really couldn't see it till last minute. The sort of grey camouflage that we had on it. So, yeah, we had some fantastic um, stuff, you know, 2v2v2. Two two two, these sort of uh, airplanes go smashing past, you know, two lightnings, two sea areas and another hawk. It's brilliant fun. Um, I then came across them again um, in the tornado um, actually during exercises, um, both out in, in Denmark. The Exercise Blue Moon and also um, the, um, oh, I can't remember the name now, um, uh, it'll come back to me in a moment, um, but it was one of the, the, the sort of standard exercises that used to happen sort of twice a year, um, ha uh, Hammer, no, I can't remember what it, 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 don't, it, it will come back, but anyway, uh, so we used to, um, when we get, again, be up the North Sea because they, they didn't get very far, you know, they used to get airborne from Bimbrook and be short of fuel, but they were, were absolutely amazing. You suddenly see these come rorting at some phenomenal speed and then you know, take their shots and then, then off, you know, they disappear upwards into the stratosphere again, or, you know, if you manage to turn, if, if you support their attack by turning towards them, they, they, they disengage and blow through and then that was them gone. Um, really, but a very, very impressive airplane, I have to say. Um, Yep, I think that's, yep, that's great. <laughs> right, so we're going to wrap up there, Mike. Uh, great stories, yep. of course. Uh, so, yeah, um, just to wrap up, go and uh, follow Mike uh, on Twitter or X now <clears throat> and go and pick up his books. Everything's linked in the description. But uh, thank you guys for coming on the chat and putting your questions in. And, Mike, yeah, thanks very much. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, yeah, as always to, to you, Mike. So thanks very much. Thanks so much indeed for having me on. I'm just going to take this opportunity to just a, a quick plug um, that my book Tornado of the Tigris, which is kind of my own experiences, is out there. It came out in paperback, I think, last year. So that's that's out there. And if you haven't read it, people who have done tell me it's good fun and they've enjoyed reading it. So uh, I ju I'll just leave that with you there as, as, as a thought. But thanks ever so much for listening to me today. <clears throat> Absolutely brilliant. And that's in the description below, guys. So yeah, once again, Mike, uh, have a great night. And yeah, I'm sure we'll chat again. I hope so. Thank you very much indeed, Mike. Cheers. <laughs>